Hey, this week we're looking at the last of the seven I Am statements of Jesus that are found in the Gospel of John. And this one, um, like all of the others, is in a larger context. This is in the Upper Room Discourses. It's found in John chapter 15. And it's a very familiar one. It's where Jesus says, I am the true vine. And that's not simple. It is a difficult metaphor um, to deal with because there are a lot of things that could go several different ways. And we'll notice that right off the bat. We're only looking at three verses today. And it's uh, John chapter 15, verses 1, 2, and 3. And this is, as I said, part of the upper room discourse. This is where... Um, the Lord's Supper is established, and there's the washing of the disciples' feet, the demonstration and illustration of what a servant is and how they are to, uh, leadership is based in service. And there's this great long teaching section. Uh, we've been talking about it in, in chapter 14, and within that is this abiding, dwelling, intimate relationship that is talked about in this upper room discourse, the giving of the Spirit or the promise of the Spirit uh, and the indwelling of the Spirit that is promised uh, at, and, and becomes a reality at Pentecost. And the, but you also have the abiding of the Father, the, of being in the Son, and, and the Son being in us, and there's, in believers, and there's this that is going on. That continues in chapter 15, and certainly with the vine imagery that is talked about. But there is something else. This one adds a phrase to it, is that I am the story of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. This one has something added to it, and it's, the Father is brought in with this statement. So let's look at these verses. I am the true vine. I am the vine, the true one. Translate it that way, but he is, he is the true vine, the genuine vine, the legitimate vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. God the Father is, and the word that is used there in Greek that is translated vine dresser literally is farmer. Vine dresser, yes, but there's more, and I suppose that is accurate because the vine dresser would dig around the vine and prepare the vine. But I like the idea of a farmer. Uh, he is farming. It is his farm. Uh, it is his vine that he is tending. It is God's vine, to be sure. He is the one who is taking care of it, and uh, Jesus is that vine. Now, there is something that is being said here. Throughout Israel's history, Israel has understood itself as the vine. The prophets speak of Israel as the vine or the vineyard, uh, especially if I can give you an example. In Psalm 80, thou didst remove a vine from Egypt. This is bringing Israel out. Thou didst drive out the nations and, and didst plant it. Thou didst clear the ground before it and took deep root and, and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shadow and the cedars of God with its boughs. It was sending out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why hast thou broken down its hedges so that all who pass that way pick its fruit? A boar from the forest eats it away and whatever moves in the field fields on, uh, feeds on it. O God of hosts, turn again now we beseech thee. Look down from heaven and see and take care of this vine. Even the shoot which thy, thy right hand has planted and on the Son whom thou hast strengthened for thyself. It is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. This is important. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the Son of man which thou didst make strong for thyself. So if we look at that Psalm, Psalm 80, and the prophets, uh, there is this sense that Israel is the vine, but the vine has gone bad. The and, in every case, when Israel is talking about the vine and the prophets, uh, the vine is not producing. The vine is producing uh, not good fruit, sometimes rotten fruit. Uh, and in this psalm itself, the, the, the vine seems to be unprotected. It seems to be broken down. Yet, there is this sense that there is one at the right hand of God. There is one that is going to be raised up, uh, the Son of Man that is going to make things right. Well, certainly. And so Jesus is this fulfillment of this vine metaphor. We have said before, Jesus is the righteous one representative of Israel. He is the servant, the suffering servant in Isaiah. 
where it begins with Israel as the servant and ends up with this righteous representative of Israel, who is of Israel, but is the righteous one of Israel, uh, the one who ends up serving and so, or carrying out the purposes of God. Israel originally is to bring light to the nations, and the nations are supposed to know of God through Israel, and theirs to be one people, one family uh, that is of Abraham, the nations that he will be the father of. But Israel arrogantly closed off any avenue of the nations coming. You must be one of us if you're going to be that. However, Israel stumbled and fumbled itself in idolatry, in not producing fruit, and not carrying out what was supposed to happen, is opening the doorways for the nations to come to God and for God to be known by the nations. And so it is prophesied, even back in Genesis chapter 3, that one would come who would put things right, God's justice, things being made right. And Jesus, in this statement, is saying that he is the true vine, is that Israel has been the vine. That is true. And I don't like to use superseded, but is the fulfillment of. He is the one that is the genuine vine that is going to give life to the vine branches. And that life is to be found in him. So he is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that the nations will come and Israel itself will come and there will be one people that is found in this vine that is the true vine, Jesus himself. That is the, um, the difference. He will produce good fruit, whereas Israel did not, uh, other than Israel produced Jesus, or God through Israel produced Jesus the Messiah, who is the righteous one, who is the representative of Israel, who will take on the sin of the world and will destroy evil and will destroy uh, sin and death and give victory through his resurrection by his death on the cross and through his resurrection. Uh, and those who are in him are resurrection people. And so as we look at this, we see that life is to be found in Jesus as those vines are to be found in him. All right, that's the first thing. Jesus is the genuine vine, um, as was intended from the beginning. My father is the vine dresser. I am the true vine. Ego I me, declaration of divinity. You remember all of these I am statements are... Um, revealing who Jesus is, but also in that process, revealing the Father as well. So in this case, what is being revealed is that Jesus is the righteous one out of Israel who is the true vine. The others have been dead wood. They have not produced the fruit that they are to produce, and Jesus is going to produce that fruit. The nations are going to come in. Israel itself is going to be brought to redemption. Uh, they are going to be saved. The nations are going to be brought into a relationship with God that they did not have prior to that, that he is the one who's going to do this. Israel should have and was supposed to, but Israel needed saving itself is the point I'm trying to make. And I know that's hard. That's complicated because it goes against every, almost everything that we have heard or thought as Christians. Well, God is done with Israel. We've got this new thing called Christianity. No, it is the fulfillment of that. Um, it is through Israel that salvation comes. We don't understand Paul if we miss that. And we certainly don't understand Jesus if we think Israel is done away with. He is the fulfillment. He is Jewish. He is Israel's Messiah. And those who are believing in him, like these disciples, will find life. The nations who come to him will be grafted in, as Paul says, and will find life. It is to be found in Jesus. And what does it mean that the father is the farmer? Well, it means that he is the one who takes care of the vine. He is the one who looks at the branches. He is the one who, who cultivates and cares for this, uh, and if you, this vine that is there. Now, notice what else is said. This is hard, too. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And the hard part is every branch in me. There is no way to say that Israel, believe, unbelieving Jews, are in any way in Christ. The only way you can get to that is that 
Israel, unbelieving Israel, is no longer a part of this vine. Since they are not a part of the legitimate vine, they are dead wood and are cut away. But you can also look at, in this sense, that a disciple, Judas himself, dead wood, he would be cut away. I tend to lean more toward Israel that is dead wood that is not believing is being cut away by God because it is not part of genuine Israel, as Paul says. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, the Father, who is the vine dresser, takes away. There's a play on words that's going here, and I hope you can follow me. Ira is the word that is used there, Ira, to take away. And every branch that bears fruit, he, uh, katharai, uh, prunes. That word can also be translated purify. We get our word catharsis, cathartic. Uh, it, it comes from that Greek word, um, uh, kathiro is the verb form. Uh, katharos is the adjective form. We're going to see that here. So he takes away iri, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes kathari, uh, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already, and see, this sounds strange if you don't know that the words also mean pure or clean, to, to purify or to cleanse. You are already clean, katharos, because of the word which I have spoken to you. All right, so let's stop right there. That's enough for today to try to comprehend and get our heads around. Jesus is the true vine, the legitimate vine, the fulfillment of what Israel is supposed to be. Salvation through Israel? Yes, because he is Israel's representative. And um, he is the one who is legitimate, who is genuine, who is true. The Father cares for this vine. And the prophets speak of this. Uh, Psalm 80 speaks of the Son of Man, the, the, the one at your right hand, who is Jesus. Uh, so as he dresses this, there is dead wood that is cut out. This has to be Israel not being in this vine, unbelieving Israel that is not part of this vine that where life is found, and that is Jesus. That is cut out. But it is also true that if you are in Jesus and you have this life and you are bearing fruit, it is that if you are legitimately, legitimately born again, if you are legitimately in Jesus Christ, there will be fruit born. What fruit? Well, fruit of the Spirit, for one. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You will also be drawing life from him, his life, his words, his truth. You will also be living out that vocation we've been talking about, of being genuinely human, showing forth the image of God, which is to see the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the, the judge, justice of God, the, the and even, yes, the rebuke and the wrath of God against those things which bring uh, destruction to his creation and harm to his creatures. Uh, that's human beings and the subhuman created order as well. And so, yes, all of that is part of this. So when he says that those who bear fruit, he's saying if you're genuinely in me, you're, it's going to be fruit there. You're going to be alive. This fruit is going to be there. The father who is the farmer, the vine dresser, comes and he prunes that one that is bearing fruit. And that means growth so that growth can take place. That means things that are uh, detrimental to that growth are taken out, cut out of that branch, that, that one who is in Christ. And that can be painful. That can be difficult. I can tell you from my own personal experience, growing in Christ is not always painless. Uh, sometimes there are things that must be cut out of our lives, things that are inappropriate, things that hinder us from being what God wants us to be. There's growth that is inward rather than growth that is outward, and God wants to um, promote our healthiness, promote our flourishing as human beings in Christ Jesus. Remember, we must remain in him, as we'll see as we go through this.
And Jesus adds this strange phrase. If you don't know that that word um, katharai or uh, katharairo, that is the verb form of that, which means to prune, but it also means to purify or to cleanse, that these words that the Father actually cleanses the vine branches that bear fruit, purifies them so that they can bear more fruit. In other words, cuts out those things that keep it from doing it. That's purifying, cleansing. And Jesus said, my word has made you clean already, He's talking to his disciples. So in what way does the word of Jesus purify and cleanse? Well, that word purifies or cleanses because it's through the word of Jesus or through the word of God or through knowing Jesus and knowing him personally that this is, takes place in our lives. And that's the only place that it can. I know that's complex, and we'll flesh it out more as we go through this passage uh, of Jesus being the true vine. Uh, and us who are and we who are believers being branches and what that means to bear fruit we'll look at that more as the week progresses right now it's sufficient to say that he is the true vine and life is to be found in him and yeah fruit should be in our lives if we should be showing forth the image of god we should be showing the fruit of the spirit it's another way of putting that but it's the same thing to show forth what it means to be genuinely human. And that is only found when we're restored in our vocation as human beings and as the image bearers of God in the world that is to be found in Jesus Christ uh, because that's where the life is found. And that's where that vocation is restored in him. I pray that you know that. Uh, the Father, listen, sometimes we move away from this idea that God is going to bring pain into our lives, is going to cause us to hurt, even if it is for our own good. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we're never closer to God the Father than when he is cutting things or purifying things in our lives so that we can grow and flourish and be healthy and bear the fruit that he wants us to bear in our lives. Um, and while we're on that subject of bearing fruit, it's not just evangelizing, although that's certainly a part of it. We will declare the glory of God in Jesus Christ, the good news in Jesus Christ. We will do that as part of the fruit, but that's not all the fruit. We tend to focus, especially evangelists, tend to focus on that's what's it. If you're not winning souls, then you're not bearing fruit. We should all be doing that but there is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, bearing the image of God. Um, that's all a part of that fruit bearing too. It's not just um, evangelism. And so uh, we tend to shy away from that purifying process. We tend to shy away from that. We don't, well, because we don't like to hurt. We don't like painful things. And growth sometimes is painful. And, uh, but, but the Father does that because he loves us and he wants us to flourish. He wants us to be healthy and whole and be what he has created us to be. And I pray that you know that, that love of the Father. And I pray that you know the life that comes by being in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Hey, listen, I love you. More importantly, God loves you. He's given his son, Jesus Christ, that you might have forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. I pray that you know that. Till tomorrow, God bless you.